This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. If you're looking for some laughs this holiday weekend, Dave Chappelle has a new stand-up comedy special that premieres Saturday night on Showtime. He also has a regular series on Comedy Central called Chappelle Show that features stand-up, sketches, and music. In Rolling Stone magazine, Chappelle's humor was described as the edgiest, most racially charged comedy in America. The DVD of the first season is the third best-selling television DVD of all time. By the way, parents, some of his humor is pretty adult. Let's start with an excerpt of one of the most talked-about sketches from Chappelle's show. Charlie Murphy, Eddie's brother, who's a regular on the show, is hosting an edition of Charlie Murphy's True Hollywood Stories, remembering his encounters in the 1980s with funk disco star Rick James. The sketch was filmed before James' recent death. As you'll hear, this fake documentary segment includes a cameo appearance by James himself. But it's Chappelle who plays the 1980s version of James. Here he is. Drink up. Be merry. Welcome to the China Club. A tang a tang tang. A tang a tang tang tang. Rick's, you know, being Rick. Come on, bitches, show me a tang. I'm Rick James. Do something. Mm. Mm. I wish I had more hands so I could give those tangs four thumbs down. <laughs> I ain't realize how high he was. Next thing you know, he's like, Sean Murphy! <laughs> What's up, partner? Darkness, everybody. Dark everyone, darkness is spreading. Go ahead, Charlie. I'm behind the bar, and I'm serving drinks, and Charlie bends over. I call, I said, Charlie, come here. Charlie, there's a new joke going around. Have you heard it? What is the five fingers? Say to the face! <laughs> what? Slap! <laughs> I asked Dave Chappelle to tell the story behind this sketch. Eddie Murphy's brother, Charlie, mm-hmm. was shooting a sketch on our show, and one of the conversations at lunch was about how he had fought Rick James on, like, ten different occasions. So it was like, what? This t- you got to tell us more. And then uh, he told us the story, and we were like, okay, this is a hilarious story. You got to come tell it on the show. And then obviously, you know, we'll dramatize it, with me playing Rick James. And then at a certain point, so we, we start moving forward with that idea, and at a certain point, Charlie's like, you know, I, I probably could get Rick for this. <laughs> so we're like, Shit, yeah, get him. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the rest is history. How, I, I think you had been planning to do an actual movie, like a Rick James movie. How does his death affect that? No, I'm not gonna do it now. Uh-huh. I mean, it was gonna be a comedy. Uh, I was hoping to have him in it. At, at a certain point, he decided he didn't want to go that route with it. The two weeks before he died, perhaps I'd spoken to him for the last time. And uh, and I think one of his major concerns about doing the feature was, you know, how his kids would perceive it. And it was when I heard him explain it, because at first I heard he has problems with the movie. He doesn't want you to say certain things. And I was like, well, I can't, you know, I'm not going to promise that. It's a deal breaker. And then when I spoke to him, I completely understood where he was coming from. You know, because I'm a father. Mm -hmm. And he was just like, there's certain things that I've done in my life that I don't know if I want to see him glorified or whatever. Or, or, you know, lampoon. Just like for the sake of his kids, it was the impression that I got. Dave Chappelle is my guest. And he has a, a comedy special coming up Saturday, September 4th, Labor Day weekend on Showtime. And, of course, he has his regular show on Comedy Central. Um, now, you do some really, f- I mean, your show is so funny. What was the original concept when you first sat down to conceive of your, your weekly program, Chappelle Show? What did you envision it being? The idea was that I wanted to do a variety show that was very personal, almost as if you, if, you know, like a comedian has a, a, a joke book where he'll write his ideas down, almost as, as if you could bring somebody's joke book to life. And uh, I think we were fairly successful at it in the sense that we do things on the show that are almost nightclub-y. That, that aren't, I don't know, things that I'm not even used to seeing on television. It becomes whatever it needs to be. Well, it's one funny. One week it was a game show, one mm-hmm. week it's a puppet show, one week it's half documentary. It can do, you can do anything. 
We know what you're and talking about, about it being like a, a comics notebook. In, in some of your shows, you actually set up the sketch with the story behind it, what you were thinking about before coming up with this sketch. Right. And that's what you did before a sketch called um, Racial Draft. And y you explained um, that, y you know, your, your wife is Asian, you're African-American. And so you've, you've had these, like, arguments about whether Tiger Woods is, is black or Asian. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> so you came right. up with this show called Racial Draft. Um, and let's hear the opening of that sketch. Good evening and welcome to the first and maybe only racial draft here in New York City. <laughs> Folks, this is for all the marbles. What happens here will state the racial standing of these Americans once and for all. That's right. And the crowd is here to support their races. Well, Rob, some of the biggest names in sports and in entertainment are on the line tonight. And I'm excited to see who's going to be drafted by which race. Seated behind me on the stage there are the various representatives. And believe it or not, the blacks have actually won the first pick. Wow, that's the first lottery a black person's won in a long time, Billy. Yes, and I'll probably still complain. <laughs> <laughs> Man, f you. Well, the black representative is heading to the microphone now. Why don't we take a listen? Be in black delegation. <laughs> No surprises there, fellas. The richest and most dominant athlete in the world. His father, black, his mother, Thai. Well, it doesn't matter anymore because now he is officially black. Dave, the Asians have got to be upset. There's no question about that, Robert. But you gotta think about it. He's been discriminated against in his time. He's had death threats. And he dates a white woman. Oh. Sounds like a black guy to me. <laughs> Taking the stage there, and if you ask me, wow. he's looking blacker already. Uh, I'd like to say it's a tremendous opportunity for me to finally be part of a race, have a home. Been so confused if I'm Caballese, so many things. So long, fried rice. Hello, fried chicken. I love you guys. So that's a, an excerpt of uh, Dave Chappelle's show. Um, Dave, can you talk about uh, like what actually happened behind the scenes in writing the sketch, and maybe talk a little first about what happens further into the sketch? The idea actually was a guy named Brian Tucker submitted the idea of having a racial draft. Finally, finally, races can stop arguing about who is who and definitively label these people once and for all, which was like, you know, that's the heavy lifting. That was a brilliant idea. So uh, Neil and I, Neil's my partner, I write the show with. We sat down, and it was like a wealth of jokes that you could do because it's the kind of thing, it's a very race-obsessed culture. You know what I mean? Like when a guy like Vin Diesel becomes famous, half of the, the things you'll hear about him is, well, what race is he? <laughs> and he just doesn't say, which I kind of think is classy. Shooting it was a blast because, uh, you know, we had the Wu-Tang Clan. We had Most Def playing the black delegate. And that was one of the first sketches we had shot last season, which was kind of like one of those things where, oh, maybe this is going to be a good season. Kind of set, it set a good tone for the season that, we'll, that we can kind of go anywhere. Now, you're really funny at doing white people. And I think, like, w when you're white, you don't think of there being, like, a white accent. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, absolutely. But when I hear you do it, I realize, okay. <laughs> There's definitely, like, a white accent. So what do you do when you do white? Uh, I take the rhythm uh, out of my voice. I <laughs> try to keep it monotone and even. But, uh, <laughs> again, all right, see, I do these things. But I'm not really, it's, it's, it's almost like uh, sometimes I watch old movies and how they portray black people, you know, with like Stephen Fetcher and all these things. I remember watching them and something in the movie made me laugh and they were like, why are you laughing at that? And it's not that I'm laughing at black people as much as I'm laughing at the way black people were perceived. Like this is what they actually thought about black people, which just seems ridiculous to me. Uh-huh. So I think, you know, when I do that, I think, again, it's not malicious. And it's not necessarily what I think of. It was just a funny character of, of what, you know, what the world looks like through my eyes. 
Is there a particular person you conjure up when when you you do a white man? Not a particular. It's a composite. It's a composite character. Of, of who? It's funny, man. <laughs> All right. You know, when I was growing up in D.C. in particular, there's a now this isn't true for me personally, but there's a lot of black people that I know who really had never had any personal experience with white people, mm -hmm. which is weird to think about in this day and time. But D.C. is a predominantly black city, and because of the economic situation and whatever, they just didn't have any contact with white people outside of being authority figures. Officer, your honor, you know, if it's a teacher or a principal, but, but it's always some kind of authority figure. So there's this whole, you know, their, their ex experience with uh, across the color line normally happened uh, via television or, you know, or something where you're dealing with an authority figure. So I, on the other hand, you know, my parents were split up. My mom was living in D.C. My dad was living in Ohio. I, I traveled to both places. So I was in the nation's capital on one end. I was in the, the heartland of America on another. So, you know, I, you know, I, I just culturally I kind of absorbed a lot. I don't know, man. I got a pretty good understanding about the culture. I think that all these differences are just cultural things. My guest is comic Dave Chappelle. More after a break. This is Fresh Air. My guest is Dave Chappelle. His series Chappelle Show is on Comedy Central. His new stand-up special premieres Saturday night on Showtime. You said in one episode of your show that after someone complained to you that your show was offensive to black people, and that person, by the way, was white, <laughs> you, you came up with this idea for a game show called I Know Black People. I know black people. Welcome to the show I Know Black People. We take contestants who claim to know black people and put their knowledge of African-American culture to the test. The contestant who answers the most questions, of course, wins our grand prize. Let's bring them out one at a time now. Our first contestant is a professor of African-American studies and history at Fordham University. The New York City police officer is a writer for such black television shows as The Chris Rock Show and Chappelle Show. Okay, our next contestant works in a Korean grocery store, is a DJ, and claims to have many black How can black people rise up and overcome? Um, how can they rise up and overcome? Well, can they overcome? No. That is correct. <laughs> Reparations. That is acceptable. This is a rap lyric? No, this is, I'm sorry. Oh, this is a general this is an question. actual question. All right. That's a, there's a complex answer there. That is correct. <laughs> Staying alive. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. Well, stop cutting each other's throat. That also is correct. How can black people rise up and overcome? Get out and vote. That <laughs> is incorrect. <laughs> Dave Chappelle, that's such a funny idea <laughs> for a show. Can you talk a little bit about what happened in the writing of the sketch, like what it was like to put this sketch together? Originally, we were going to do, a, we were going to write the material. We were going to write it like an actual sketch. And when we sat down and started to write it, it was one of these things where it's like, this would be better if we got actual people and just quizzed them. And we just came up with questions. We just so had them. You put actually the set got together. real people. You got like a white cop. All those people were real. We get, we had them get us a police officer, get us a Korean grocer, get us a black dude. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, everybody, everybody. It was completely authentic. And then all the hosting elements were just like as far as those were like off the cuff, you know. But the 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 answers were incredible, man. The things that these people were saying. One of the, one of the things they're gonna see me, so they they kind of go for for being funny. But 
all of them were really nervous, and they were all kind of afraid that I was making fun of them. And then once we got to shooting, I think everyone just kind of un, kind of relaxed and uh, kind of unwound. And I don't know. That's one of my favorite sketches we've done. Now, you, you grew up in different neighborhoods because, I guess this was because of your parents' divorce. If I understand correctly, you grew up in Silver Springs, Maryland, uh, Yellow Springs, Ohio, because your father was teaching at Antioch College, which is located there, and Washington, D.C. Um, so uh, you went to schools in these different places, too? Yeah, I did elementary school in Silver Springs. Middle school in Ohio and high school in Washington. Were you almost part of like different cultures in those different places? Were there different ways of like dressing and different music that your friends listened to depending on which place it was, whether it was the suburbs or the city or Ohio or Washington? I think elementary school was more integrated because, you know, people were younger. They mixed freely with black kids, white kids. Everybody was... You know, there was no real racial hang-ups in elementary school. Uh, and people weren't really clothes conscious because we were young. And then by the time I got to middle school in Ohio, that's when you start seeing alligators on people's sweater. And people start getting into, like, <laughs> <laughs> status symbols and stuff. And that was the first time where I really started like, hey, man, I'm poor. <laughs> and, like, we don't have any money, do we? And then uh, when I got to high school, so then I started getting into clothes, and I go to high school, and, you know, I was gone during middle school. Crack came out while I was gone. So I saw, like, the before and after picture. I had to piece the crack epidemic together. Like, my, I remember my first day of high school, and they were like, all right, look, if you have a pager on in school, then there's immediate grounds for suspension because we all know what that means. I was in the back like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and then, of course, I figured out that... Uh, and then I was also trying to figure out how everyone had all this, like, gold and expensive stuff. And then I was like, oh, okay, everybody's selling drugs. I knew so many people in the beginning, like my freshman year of high school, that were selling drugs. I can't even imagine how many people were using them. You know, the crack ec epidemic was crazy, man. And uh, I think a lot of the stuff that... Uh, I did my act just coming from Ohio from, and, and then going straight back to D.C. during the crack epidemic. I think that all the inequities were just underlined. So how did you change as you changed um, environments? It's funny, man. When I was in Ohio, I was the first like real confident period of my life. Like I started gaining confidence because for these kids, I was this outsider, and I... I had to make friends, and uh, that was when I, I got, like, this huge reputation. Everyone was like, this guy's really funny. I remember in middle school, everyone was just like, this guy, Dave, is so hilarious. Then when I got to high school and the crack epidemic was out, you know, what it took to be popular during that, I just wasn't willing to do. Which was what? You know, sell drugs. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. <laughs> if you didn't have money, you couldn't get the girl you wanted, you know, it was a crack epidemic. Selling drugs was like a legitimate job in the in in in, in the high school I was going to, and around, all around D.C. It was like girls like drug dealers because they had money. I wasn't willing to be that, but it was kind of like that context kind of isolated me initially, and then when I started doing stand up, it was like I I thrived all over again. So when you started doing stand up and you were. Still in high 14. school? 14. Okay, in Washington. What was what were the jokes about? What was the humor about? Uh, man, the first act, Jesse Jackson was running for president, so I used to do jokes about that. Like what? I used to talk about stuff I saw on TV, like Alf. And, but they all had race in them, in one way or another. Obviously, Jesse Jackson jokes don't have some racial in them. Uh, Alf, my whole thing was like the alien comes three billion miles from space and gets a home with the white family. It was the paradox <laughs> in that joke. Which all sounds corny now, but remember, I was 14, so it was like, wow, well, you know. Uh, what else was I talking about? All kinds of stuff. Like In the very beginning, I didn't know that comedians had material. Like, I thought they just went up there and would just talk spontaneously. So I used to do the same thing, which is probably better that I started that way. 
because that in and of itself is a skill that a lot, you know, a lot of comedians are afraid to abandon their act once they get the once they get a good amount of time, they just want to stick to it. So who who were your audiences then? All right, in those days in Washington, again, remember, this is a majority black city. There was no black comedy clubs. And I remember club owners saying things like, we only put one, we'll never put more than one black person on a show because it offends the audience. I've heard all these things <laughs> in, in Washington, D.C. Uh-huh. You know, it was pretty exclusive. Uh, there was one point <laughs> where they actually had a rule that there was no more cursing on our stage. It's like, this is in 88. And one of the comics who was black, this is pretty funny. He's like, uh, he's like, look, man, he said, I curse. He said, black people use profanity because we live a profane lifestyle. And then he says something that I can't say on the radio. <laughs> but he's basically like, if you see Roach crawling up the wall, you're not going to be like, golly gee, look at the roaches. You're going to look at this mother roach. You know, you're just going to just gonna go for it. I know you're going to cut that out, but <laughs> it was really funny, though. But just the fact, thinking back on it, the fact that there was all these limitations and all these weird issues that these club owners had, in one way, maybe prepared me for television. Dave Chappelle, his new comedy special premieres Saturday night on Showtime. His series Chappelle's show is on Comedy Central. He'll be back in the second half of the show. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross, back with comic Dave Chappelle. His stand-up comedy special premieres on Showtime Saturday night. His series Chappelle Show is on Comedy Central. When we left off, he was saying that the limitations club owners placed on his stand-up act helped prepare him for producers' expectations in broadcast TV. You know, before I had this show, I'd done 11 television pilots, which uh, was very grueling. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to develop TV, man, especially if you're the youngest guy in the room. And at first I would defer to these people just because they were older than me and they all had suits on, and I guess they know what they're talking about. But, Dave, let me tell you something about TV. People want blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And our research shows blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Done that 11 times, you know. Each time would get it got progressively more frustrating. You know, I used to have arguments and all kinds of stuff. And uh, the last straw, I was developing a show for Fox, and they wanted me to change one of the characters uh, arbitrarily to make the character white because they felt like it would make the show, the word they used was have a more universal appeal. It's like, okay, you're the universe now? <laughs> but it was like, a, <laughs> we'll give it a more universal appeal. So I quit because at that point I was like, this is, impo this is an impossible thing to negotiate. There's no way that, I mean, I don't know, you just can't make TV that way. Like, then how do you explain the Cosby show working? Or how do you explain Will Smith's show working? You know, there were so many examples of successful shows, and these were considered flukes. Like, there were successful shows with all black cast, and it was considered a total fluke because of some pie chart this guy was holding. And uh, that's when I was like, okay, there's no way I can do this. My guest is Dave Chappelle, and he has his uh, weekly show on Comedy Central and now a Showtime special coming up on Saturday, Labor Day weekend um, at 9 o'clock. Um, I want to ask you another question about having grown up in three different places, uh, suburban Maryland, suburban Ohio, and Washington, D.C. Rural Ohio. Rural Ohio. Suburban Maryland, rural Ohio, and Washington. Okay, so, so that exposes you to different people, different cultures, different uh, kind of geographic landscapes, different, uh, different ways of living. And I'm wondering if that helped give you the ability to kind of stand back and look at people and see what was kind of funny and ridiculous and absurd about all of us. Do you know what I mean? Because I, I feel like y you have that gift. Of just like yeah, looking back and li li standing outside and looking at everyone and seeing, <laughs> seeing some pretty funny things about us all. Yeah, because most of the people that are stereotype, I know, I know the people that the stereotypes are based off. Of. Like personally, I've met people like this. You know, if uh, you know, I mean, I can remember friends of mine growing up. Like we used to all play football after school, and be like, it's four of us was black. Two of, 
two of us was Vietnamese. It was a Jewish guy from the deep south. <laughs> it was like, it was such an, it was an eclectic group, you know, but we all got along. We all, you know, were friends. Uh, in the household I grew up in, my parents were somewhat, I don't know how, I don't know how to explain it, but over our mantle place, there was pictures of Malcolm X. You know, we I listened to Dick Gregory records growing up. I listened to The Last Poets. I mean, you know, there were books of, all over the house and, always reading stuff so so like you know like people like frederick douglas i i you know these guys pictures were on my on my walls when i was growing up you, you described your family growing up as the broke huxtables <laughs> yeah we were like broke huxtables your mother was a, or is a unitarian minister she was yeah yeah she was i believe she was the first black woman ordained in that unitarian church um and your father was a music professor yeah. What kind of music? Voice. He's singing. Uh, he used to sing opera and stuff. So, so your your family was really very educated and probably instilled those values in in you. Was there pressure on you to do well in school? And what you really wanted was to be a comic. I mean, first of all, I was a horrible student. My parents, you know, my dad was very philosophical about these kind of things. As a matter of fact, when I I'm the first person in my family not to go to college, like since slavery. And uh, my grandmother, my mother's mother, didn't like that at all. She, uh, at first, because, like, I, I mean, I was 17. I'm like, I'm not going to college. I'm going to move to New York and try to make it and stand up. And uh, she was, she was, she kind of flipped out. She was like, it was, it's a dream of mine. This is a heavy guilt trip. She go, it's a dream of mine to see all of my grandbabies graduate from college before I die. It's like, why I gotta bring Dan up, man? And that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> but then I, uh, my dad's whole take on it was, unless you want to do something that requires you go to college, then college could very well be a waste of your time. And he was a college and, uh, professor, so coming from him, that must have really registered yeah, on you. he was an educator. He was an educated man. And I, I think my parents ultimately wanted me to be happy. You know, I mean, my argument was, you know, well, Dad, if you're making a teacher's salary, that's, if I can make a teacher's salary doing stand-up, to me, I'd rather do that than teach. It's like, and he understood where I was coming from. Like, you know, it's like I didn't necessarily have to be rich and famous. Obviously, I wanted to, but that wasn't necessarily my aim. I just really, 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 to this day, I really like doing stand-up. Since you started when you were so young, your mother had to, did she have to or did she just want to come to the clubs with you? Was that required as like an official chaperone because you were underage? Originally, she had to. Once everyone started knowing me, this was kind of like our routine. We'd meet down at the club. I'd be coming from school. She'd be coming from work. It was cool, man. It was like a good way to spend time together. And then uh, at a certain age, like maybe a year into it, you know, she'd get tired at night. We'd both burn the candles both ends, but I'd always want to go, so she just let me go. And, and you know, not until I'm an ad, though, then she tells me how scary that was for her. In what way? You know? I mean, she tells stories like she'd hear gunshots in, in the middle of the night. And, you know, she'd want, oh, my God, it's my, it's my baby. All right. I mean, remember, this is D.C. during the crack epidemic. But I guess in her mind, it's like of all the bad things that my child could be doing, he just wants to tell jokes at these clubs. And it was a controlled environment for me. It's not like the bartender's going to give me drinks. I'm 14. It's, you know, everyone kind of looked out for me. It wasn't like a... I mean, I saw stuff going on, but not really. It was, it was more of a... It was really goal-oriented time I was spending there. Now, when you were still pretty young, Mel Brooks cast you in his movie uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights. Yeah. What was it like to work with? How old were you? What was it like to me work with Mel Brooks then? Well, I was I was probably eighteen or nineteen, mm -hmm. and uh, I was starstruck. Mel Brooks is a real warm guy. He makes you feel. He doesn't have any errors on him. You know what I mean? I get the feeling that he was real unaffected by his career. He just he's just another guy. He just loves comedy, and. Uh, in certain ways, it was kind of a mentor relationship in the sense that I got to watch a guy execute a vision he had, a guy that I respected and the guy that uh, 
I don't know. It was that was a crazy experience. But the thing I always think about Mel Brooks is he was just such a nice man, you know. Like we real me and this guy really hit it off during that movie. Did he, he give you any good up. advice? I mean, he I would learn from him more and just like he would tell these stories, man. He told me about when he saw Richard Pryor for the first time and riding blazing saddles and trying to get Richard in the movie and the studio wouldn't let me and blah 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 and blah blah blah. And I mean, just him telling these stories just did a lot for my imagination, man, and it kind of inspired me. You know, I mean, for me, like, even when I started writing, actually, that advice came from Eddie Murphy. Excuse me, when we were doing Nutty Professor, Eddie Murphy was like, you know, you should really write uh, because the way you tell jokes, he said, it's like you see jokes in pictures. Which is kind of true. It's like I kind of it's explaining these images I have in my in my mind. And he said, "You should write, man. You got like a writer's mind." And you know, and I think that's when I started trying to to write more, just trying to to self generate. And thank and thank God because if, if I wasn't able to come up with ideas, I wouldn't work right now. I wouldn't be working right now. Well, Dave Chappelle, thank you so much for talking with us. I really appreciate it. All right, no problem. It was, it was good to meet you. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our interviews and reviews are produced and edited by Amy Sallett, Phyllis Myers, Naomi Person, Monique Nazareth, Henry Bodonado, Patty Leswing, and Ian Chalog. I'm Terry Gross. Mm-hmm.